It's my nerd world. Welcome to it, a Star Wars podcast. Happy 4th of July holiday week. I'm recording this on the 4th of July, but depending on when you are listening to this, perhaps it's on Monday when you have the day off. I have the entire week off, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to sit down and talk a little Star Wars with you this week. All right, uh, the Acolyte showrunner uh, talks about the profound effect the Phantom Menace had on her Star Wars series. We'll give you some details. The director of the uh, upcoming Star Wars Rogue Squadron, the next film to hit the big screen, uh, Patty Jenkins, had a chance to talk with the Associated Press. Uh, I have the audio for you, and I'll give you some of my comments, uh, plus a little bit of listener feedback this week. So let's not waste uh, any more time and dive right into a Star Wars podcast. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. Calling to you. My nerd road. Just let it in. It is a Star Wars podcast, and I'm your host, John Justice. Glad you're with the show again this week. As always, if you want to email, talkshownerd at gmail.com. You can also leave a comment on YouTube, and the podcast is available on pretty much every single podcast platform. So if you are listening to this on YouTube, but you're like, I don't want to hear so many commercials, then go and find it on Spotify or iHeartRadio or Spreaker or iTunes. It's available in all of those places. All right, so as I mentioned on the show this week, uh, the showrunner for The Acolyte and uh, the director for Rogue Squadron had some comments about their upcoming projects. I will share uh, that with you. Um, I'm not going to be getting into uh, The Bad Batch this week, another great episode, but it was another one of these kind of filler episodes. Uh, was very cute, though, and um, really looking forward to the to the rest of this series, uh, obviously. I'm also not going to spend um, any more time than just right now talking about Star Wars Visions. So Star Wars Visions is the um, other Star Wars project that we can expect this year, along with The Bad Batch. We're getting uh, this anime project, Star Wars Visions, and then, of course, Book of uh, Boba Fett coming up in December. Star Wars Visions will be out in September. They, Disney and Lucasfilm, dropped a first look, doing that thing with my fingers, um, of Star Wars Visions with a um, with a companion video showing some of the artwork, talking with uh, some of the Japanese directors of the anime series. And I will watch it. But of all of the new, newly announced uh, projects, Visions is probably the one that I'm looking forward to the least. I'm not a huge fan of anime. And while my curiosity will, um, will keep me watching the show when, it, when it's released, some of the details that I received um, continue to not really um, excite me. This is uh, none of what the directors in Star Wars Visions... Um, are creating is considered canon. They gave them a blank slate to tell their own stories. And so these are stories that um, are not, again, not canon, but it doesn't, they don't even need to be attached to any previous um, content whatsoever. It really is just this, tell a Star Wars story, make your own characters, do what you want to do. And also, none of these seem to be uh, anime versions of the content we've seen before. So, this is going to be exciting for anime fans, but again, I'm not very much into anime, and the fact that the stories that they will be telling in this series are not connected to any sort of larger canon doesn't really get me all that ex- excited for it beyond wanting to watch it and check it out because it is a Star Wars uh, project. But I would be curious to um, I would be curious to know what you think. Are you looking forward to to um? Two Star Wars visions. Are you an anime fan? What about it? Um, what about the ideas that they presented? Uh, do you find attractive? So I would like to hear from you 
about Star Wars Visions, but again, it's just not something that I, as a Star Wars fan, um, am, am really like, ooh, I want to see that. Nope, not really looking forward to it. But again, it's Star Wars, so I'll absolutely go and uh, and and check it out. So, uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, move over to uh, the couple of news items that we do have to talk about this week. This is not going to go the way you think. So there were a couple of different interviews that have been released um, about the Acolyte, specifically interviews that were done with the showrunner, Leslie Headland. Um, now, when these interviews began to drop, I first thought, well, okay, this is interesting. We're getting quite a bit of commentary around uh, Leslie Headland and uh, the Acolyte. So perhaps this is a show that is farther down the line, and we can expect it sooner than I think a lot of us are expecting it. It's not really – The Acolyte is not a show that is talked about very much just because of the lack of details for it, nor is it listed on timelines that fans have been coming up with of when we can expect these shows. I mean, we think we all know that we're, we've got Andor coming up. We've got the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. We, of course, got Book of Boba Fett. Got word that apparently The Mandalorian Season 3 will start filming this uh, September. Um, so I thought, well, maybe The Acolyte is something that will appear sooner than a lot of us had thought. Um, but the commentary was more circling around the past month and the showrunner Leslie Headland than it was about the possibility of this show being um, one that will arrive sooner than we expect. But be that as it may, let me go ahead and share with you some of the comments that the showrunner did make about her upcoming show. Um, she was asked specifically about The Acolyte, the Star Wars series, and she says, What I can say is the reason it did appeal to me personally is that I was 18 years old when The Phantom Menace came out. And I was a very, very big Star Wars fan. I remain a big Star Wars fan. But at that particular time, right after the re-releases and the fact that I was in high school, it just kind of all coincided at a time where I was discovering who I was. I was discovering who I was artistically. I was kind of realizing um, what I wanted to do with my life. Headland, who is also the co-creator and showrunner of the Netflix show Russian Doll, told the rap, and then this big, huge event, cultural event, happened that was the Phantom Menace. She continued. And I know there were varying reasons to it. And certainly there were a lot of people that had grown up with the original trilogy who were disappointed by it. But I actually was very intrigued by why George Lucas had, had uh, started us at that particular point. I kind of wondered, but what happened to lead up to this? That's kind of where my Star Wars fan brain went, was like, how did we get here? And why are the Jedi like this? When are they, when they are in power, why are they acting this way? And how is it they're not having the reaction that you would think they would to Anakin's presence and what Qui-Gon Jinn is saying about how passionately he feels about training him and bringing him into the fold. It's like even the discovery of Darth Maul is kind of met with this like, hmm, interesting kind of feeling. So I just think for me, my brain has always buzzed around that area and wondered what's going on here or what has been going on here. Uh, the Acolyte showrunner also thinks it's important to make her series accessible to not just diehard Star Wars fans, but also a viewer who was just entering this world for the first time. Something she thinks was achieved with Disney Plus and the first uh, live-action Star Wars series, The Mandalorian. So these comments are really fascinating to me. And it's going to play into a little bit more commentary that I have after I play you this clip from the Rogue One director, Patty Jenkins, about Rogue Squadron. But what I find most interesting and I'm gonna, about these comments, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read hard, I'm going to read hard into what he, what she said. Um, and again, going back to the headline of the article, uh, the acolyte showrunner Leslie Headland had a profound effect 
um, Hedlund on the profound effect the Phantom Menace had on her series. And so we know that the Acolyte is going to be dealing with some, obviously, dark side elements. And based off the graphics alone um, and a, a sort of a red light slaver thra- slash through the actual logo for the Acolyte and comments that have been made, we know that this is going to be dark side sort of centric focused on this particular character, whoever this character might be. We also know that it takes place post what's happening in the High Republic. The fact that she is asking all these questions about the Phantom Menace makes me feel like what she's alluding to, hinting at, or being very direct if you take these comments at face value as you read into them like I am. This feels like um, a lead into the Phantom Menace in a similar way that Rogue One was um, ended up being a lead in into A New Hope. That's not to say that the Acolyte will end 10 minutes before the Phantom Menace begins, but it sounds like the story in the Acolyte will be laying the groundwork for the state of the galaxy that we see in the Phantom Menace. Again, these comments, right? Why are the Jedi like this? When they are in power, why are they acting this this way? Why are they not having a reaction to Anakin's presence, right? And what Qui-Gon Jinn is saying about how passionately he feels about training Anakin, bringing him into the fold. Even the discovery of Darth Maul is met with like, hmm, kind of interesting. So I think originally the reason why all of those characters and that film brought about that type of questioning from Leslie Headland wasn't so much about what George had in mind about what happened prior to the Phantom Menace, but it was more of just the way that he directed the Phantom Menace, which kicked open the door to tell a story, potentially, that Leslie Hedlund is is telling. That is to say, I don't think that George sat down and made the Phantom Menace and thought, boy, one day somebody will go and explain why everybody is acting this way. One of the complaints, one of the biggest complaints the Phantom Menace has always had is that um, the acting feels a little wooden, right? People make this comment often. And what she's speaking to kind of leans into that, right? There's kind of a meh to Darth Maul. There's kind of this meh when it comes to Anakin's presence. Now, I think that could speak to, and it sounds like this is what Leslie Hedlund is alluding to, sort of the hubris of the Jedi at the time who should be more concerned than they really are. But the idea that with the Acolyte, we could get some real understanding of why they're acting that way in The Phantom Menace has me really excited. I was already excited for this show, just based off of the fact that I really like the idea of having a dark side-centric story, because we haven't really, you know, had that. But the idea that this show, The Acolyte, based off of what Leslie Headland, the showrunner, is saying, could potentially add some context to The Phantom Menace, which could raise its level in terms of enjoyment with this new storytelling, has me really excited. I love A New Hope, obviously, right? We all do. That's what started this whole thing off. You go back and watch it now, and The New Hope has a very genuine feeling and vibe to it. When you watch The Mandalorian, it's very much the same way. It's not boring. It's just paced a little slower, right? It's very deliberate in its pacing. It's not like the the sequel trilogy. And this is something, again, that I'll talk about a little bit further when we get to the uh, commentary past the comments from, from Patty Jenkins. So this idea, like Rogue One did for A New Hope. Like for me, watching Rogue One and A New Hope, Rogue One raises the enjoyment level of A New Hope in a way that I didn't realize it could. Having this story of what these individuals did to sacrifice in order to bring about the events that take place in A New Hope, they all just blend together in a in a, in a really exciting way to take this film that was released decades ago and to bring a new level of context and layer on top of it with this fantastic storytelling in Rogue One was a was was a masterstroke and it sounds like this is potentially what they could be doing uh with the acolyte which has me really really excited as always though what are your thoughts talk show nerd at gmail.com uh, or leave a comment up on youtube let's move on to our next item um filmmaker patty jenkins has a 
wealth of mythology to embrace from the Legends corner of the Star Wars saga. She uh, recently pointed out that her upcoming Star Wars Rogue Squadron would take the concept of Rogue Squadron into a new era to embrace and explore elements of the franchise. From the first time the project was announced, Jenkins made it clear how much she wanted to make the best fighter pilot movie of all time, with it sounding as though the previous adventures featuring the squadron helped her establish the tone and setting as the adventure itself will pave a way, a new path for itself. Fans uh, first became familiar with Rogue Squadron, thanks to the brief mentions in the opening Hoth scenes of Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, But when the original films concluded, the adventures of the elite pilots were continued in a series of books now relegated to the Legends brand. Following the release of the books, the concept also earned a video game entry, which further explored the pilots. So now while the concept may not be as well known as other parts of the franchise, Jenkins detailed how she understood that tackling the concept of Rogue Squadron came with a lot of inerrant pressure. I'm in love with all three projects on my plate right now. I'm definitely doing Rogue Squadron next, and I'm excited to do Wonder Woman 3. And so, you know, these are all, and Cleopatra is coming along great as well. And so we'll see how it works out. But, um, you know, I may just never stop. I may just make movies back to back if they would let me. I, I would love it. So I think the Michael Stackpole books and the and the video game and all of the Rogue Squadron books. I think they all have. A, there's a there's an incredible history that it's really important to honor, and um, and yet it must be brought to a new age because we have to tell a new story with it. And so you're kind of you're trying to blend the best of everything and make it the great fighter pilot movie, which I've always wanted to make as well. And so um, yeah, you're just it's a it's a it's a big brew <laughs> of things that you're trying to put together and still keep a very simple story. You're trying to bring the best of yourself and use it to make something beautiful that honors the legacy before you. But of course, it's like it's a huge amount of pressure. Of, uh, and Wonder Woman was a huge amount of pressure as well. So, you know, it's not it's not a totally new feeling to me. But yeah, definitely uh, nerve wracking. <laughs> So, Patty Jenkins didn't answer, I think, the number one question right now, which is, again, where in the timeline does this movie take place? She mentioned this new era again, okay? Um, You couple that with the comments from Kathleen Kennedy, who made a similar comment, and it does sound like this is post the rise of Skywalker. Uh, People have pointed out, and I'll point it out again, that the logo for Rogue Squadron, definitely shows an original trilogy era X-Wing fighter. Uh, That could also simply be a placeholder if we're talking about a film that takes place post The Rise of Skywalker and Starfighter Pilots. One could argue that we're probably going to get an update on the X-Wing. Maybe a different vehicle altogether, although they did show an X-Wing, so I imagine it will be an X-Wing of some time, we of some type. We do know that there were some new X-Wings that were in uh, Star Wars uh, Resistance, but the one that they showed on the logo, right, the, um, the outline um, of it is definitely an original trilogy era uh, X-Wing fighter. So... A couple of things popped into my head with the comments that she that that she made, and I just want to throw out some questions for you, and you're welcome to go and respond and share your thoughts, talkshownerd at gmail.com, or leave a comment up on, up on YouTube. So um, I'm going to present my original trilogy idea for Rogue Squadron again, just in the off chance that that is what this story is going to, that is the era this story is going to end up taking uh, taking place. So my, my, my idea was that calling it Rogue Squadron Seems rather interesting to me, especially considering we did get a movie Rogue One. Um, now, Patty Jenkins has now mentioned the the Stackpole books, right, and the original, you know, Rogue Squadron stories and the video games. So it seems pretty clear. Okay, that's what she's focusing on, and that's what this is about. So it makes sense you call it Rogue Squadron. In which case, it doesn't really align with with it being sort of a in spirit sequel to Rogue One. That being said. I think there is a way that you could use the success of Rogue One and the way they told the story and tell a Rogue Squadron story in a similar vein. And my idea, for those that uh, haven't heard it before, was if you did a Rogue Squadron story that actually took place across all three of the original trilogy stories, so four, five, and six, 
You could start off with pilots that we were not introduced to that were a part of what happened <clears throat> on the assault on the Death Star and then follow them through the chain of events from a different point of view through the Empire Strikes Back, the battle at Hoth, um, and then moving into Return of the Jedi and the Battle of the Death Star 2, right? You could tell a story in the original trilogy across all three of those stories from a different point of view, and you could really have a ton of fun with that, right? I mean, you could have original trilogy characters that are kind of coming in and out of your story. You could see these amazing battles from different perspectives. That being said, I don't think they're going to do that. <laughs> I do think that if I were a betting man, I would bet on this is going to be a new era post the rise of Skywalker film. Okay. Now, that being said, a lot of questions in my mind get raised. Okay. Who are they fighting for one? So who's going to be the big bad in this? If we are talking about a fighter pilot movie, okay, you could go the Top Gun route where you have a, this is more of a personal story of these pilots and the conflict that they are going through in their lives, not necessarily versus a big bad. And, you know, in, in Top Gun, we get the sort of the opening and the end altercations, right, with foreign entities, but it's not like in the movie they're gearing up for a big fight against an enemy. It's more of just an altercation. Um, I don't believe it's going to go that way. We're talking Star Wars, so fighter pilot movie to me suggests battles, dogfights, which would equal a very formidable opponent. So that being said, who is that formidable opponent? Why would they have an arsenal at their disposal? Are we looking at remnants of the First Order with, with this? Does this establish this new era where we could potentially begin a new saga films, right? Where these new saga films would, it, would, would exist. Is this going to be a male or female protagonist? I think I lean towards female because that seems to be what the trend is right now. And given that Patty Jenkins is, um, you know, has been focusing on sort of female driven um, uh, storytelling. I think the, my, my guess is it's going to be a female protagonist, but you just don't know. Um, does this uh, protagonist have a connection to the, uh, to the force? Okay. And how long until we return to a storyline um, like the saga, where we have the force conflict of dark, of dark versus light and the fantasy elements? It seems like right now Disney is very pleased to move away from the more fantasy type of storytelling and sticking and, and want to stick with, at least for now, the type of storytelling that we really got in A New Hope, right? A New Hope has those fantasy elements because of the Force, but it really is sort of the hero's journey and the story of Luke Skywalker. It's only in the later films, right? Empire, Return of the Jedi, and then, of course, getting into the prequels, and certainly as we get into the sequels, that we really begin to expand, to, to expand on the... The fantasy elements, right? Your Knights of the Round Table type elements of the Star Wars storytelling. And right now, it seems as if, apart from Visions, right, which will have the Jedi and stuff like that. But again, that's not canon. When you look at what's happened with The Mandalorian, when you look at what's happening with uh, Kenobi, when you look at what's happening with Andor, these are all stories that are removed from the larger saga fantasy storytelling. So... It has me, again, wondering how long until we get back to that, because I'm not expecting that we're going to see that in, in Rogue Squadron. Now, whether or not Disney is doing the right thing remains to be seen. I, it, it, it makes sense that they would hold off on those larger fantasy-type elements for when we get back into the Star Wars saga films at some point in time. I just wonder how long it's going to be until we get there until the conflict is the darkness versus the light. And very curious to see how they play with that inside of Rogue Squadron, right? It was there in Rogue One, but it was just sort of there in the background of Jyn Erso's mom telling her to reach out to the Force or, or um, you know, Chirrut Imwe and his connection to the Force. It was there as an element, much in the same way it was in A New Hope, but it didn't really expand beyond that until we got further into the storytelling. I've been re-watching uh, The Mandalorian as of late. I've been editing um, book six in my Embark series, and I've had it on in the background. And 
Uh, and it's another one of the circumstances where sitting down and watching it and just watching it, because at one point I actually closed my laptop and just started watching the series again, uh, really started to enjoy it. But the the kinship it has to the original trilogy stuck out a lot more than it had in the past. I think it's because I'd been spending so much time watching the saga films and the sequel trilogy that going back and watching The Mandalorian, you can really see how it harkens back to that original trilogy and specifically A New Hope, right? The vibe part of it. But it's, um again, there is a very distinct difference between The Mandalorian and the sequel trilogy. The vibe, the fantasy element of it, right? We're getting a lot of the latter and expecting at some point to return to the epic saga storytelling that we got in the right in those saga films i'm just wondering again and i keep asking the question but how long will it be until we get back there um so we'll see we'll see i'm i'm really interested in rogue squadron um as you know if you listen to the podcast for any length in time i love spaceships it's one of my favorite parts i love the battles but i also love that the fantasy element of star wars too right the mythology of it uh, the magic doing that thing with my fingers. And it's one of the reasons why I like the sequel trilogy so much. I just I love what they did with the with the dyad and Ray and and Ben Solo, their relationship and even getting to the end of the series and the rise of Skywalker and having Palpatine return and you know his pulling right the force out of the of the dyad to re- to rejuvenate himself to the point where he actually has new ro- new you know uh, new robes i i dig i dig all that i really like that element of it and we have the force in the mandalorian but it just doesn't have that big epic sweeping sort of romance type storytelling so i for one look forward to when disney feels confident enough and lucasfilm feels confident enough to return to that instead for the time being, because I don't think we're going to get much of that in Obi-Wan Kenobi either. For the time being, we're going to continue to get the storytelling that will be more in line with the very beginning of Star Wars. And that is the Force is there, but these are individual stories that don't really have a, at this point, a larger impact on the galaxy at large and don't contain nearly as much of the fantasy elements as what we've seen uh, before. Now, they're certainly doing that in High Republic, and maybe this is all leading to me needing to go and check out what's been going on in the High Republic series because uh, I have not been paying attention to that at all. So perhaps I need to go and check that out because it sounds like um, what they're delivering in the comics and the books in the High Republic is falling in line with exactly what I'm talking about of what we're not currently slated to be getting when it comes to live action. As always, curious to know uh, your thoughts on all of this ranting. Talkshownerd at gmail.com. I need someone to show me my place in all this. We just have one listener feedback this week, and it's okay. It's the summertime. You guys are busy, and I don't mind. But friend of the show, Miranda, uh, emails. You know, with everyone talking about how they want to see certain characters in Star Wars coming back, even old characters from the original and prequel trilogy, no one really talks about the possibility of future content for Grogu. Why hasn't anyone done theory videos about what he could do when he's a little older and has gone through with his training with Luke or maybe other masters? Don't just sit around and wait hoping for a possible return in Mandalorian Season 3. He deserves to be more than a supporting character of the show and be the Shirley Temple of Star Wars. The lad has a bright future ahead of him and has plenty uh, to make great uh, Grandpa Yoda proud. So I think that's largely due to the fact that I don't know that there's a lot of places to really go and, and speculate about Grogu. We know he's with Luke, and we have a general understanding of what happens to Luke um, in this period of time from when we saw him in the season finale of, of in the uh, season finale of season two of the Mandalorian, but we don't really know what happens when it comes to him setting up his, his training temple. Uh, we don't know what happens with, with uh, Grogu when we get to the events of the sequel trilogy. And so right now it's a little tough to go and sort of speculate on what could potentially happen because a lot of times some of the most in-depth speculation circles around things within a particular timeline that we do know. And right now, that period of time 
apart from what we got in Resistance, which doesn't help at all, that period of time between The Mandalorian and uh, The Force Awakens is kind of, right, We it's kind of empty, apart from Star Wars Resistance. So without having any sort of context of which to try to inject a Grogu commentary into, it's a little difficult to, uh, to really speculate uh, beyond the fact that we know he's with Luke. We assume he's not there when Ben Solo turns on him and leading into the events of, of what happens in The Force Awakens. And so I also think that the people that made, you know, the John Favreau, Disney, and Lucasfilm knew they had something special with Grogu, but you don't ever really know how special something is going to be until it gets up there on the big screen. Like, even watching the first episode of The Mandalorian and the introduction of Grogu, I was like, oh, that's cool. Never did I think that that was going to be as popular and he would be as popular as he ended up becoming after just that initial introduction. I was like, oh. I mean, I even thought, well, okay, well, maybe this is just the opening episode. He'll pass off Grogu to somebody else and we'll move on to another adventure. Um, I didn't really anticipate that it would become the focal point of that particular series. And so... uh, I think there'll be a lot of discussion around Grogu, but that's going to happen once we have some context that we can go and attach him to. And right now, we just we just don't have that. All right, that wraps up the show this week. Again, thank you so much for checking out a Star Wars podcast. I really do appreciate it. One more time, for good measure, talkshownerd at gmail.com. You can go on by mynerdworld.net. And uh, check out the blog there. I often put up free codes for audiobooks. And if you want to support My Nerd World, a Star Wars podcast. Um, as always, head on over to Amazon.com and uh, pick up your preferred version, paperback, ebook, um, or audiobook, narrated and produced by me of uh, my Embark a science fiction space opera series with echoes of Robert Heinlein and Alan Dean Foster. Embark is part apocalyptic disaster and the spirit of Star Wars and an exciting science fiction epic. Follow five friends on a journey of survival from the Earth to the Moon, Europa, Mars, and beyond in this explosive space opera series debut in Embark Book One. Um, five books available right now in the series with a sixth book available in the next month uh, that is being edited right now. So if you want to support the show, uh, head on over to Amazon and search for John, J-O-N, Justice, and Embark and pick up your preferred copy of my science fiction series. Again, I hope you have a fantastic holiday. Thank you so much for checking out the show, and we'll be back again next week. Bye. The Force will be with you always. My Nerd World.